All right. So everybody, welcome uh, to the AMSSM Fellow Online Education Lecture Series. Tonight's uh, topic is cervical injuries in athletes, uh, which will be presented by Dr. Julian Bales. I'll uh, do an introduction more formally in just a moment. My name is Jim Muller. I'm uh, the Fellowship Director at Henry Ford Health System in Detroit, Michigan. And um, uh, I was part of the group that, that to help form this online education uh, subcommittee. And we're very happy to have you with us today uh, to, to listen to this lecture. Um, I wanna go over some basic ground rules uh, uh, and goals. So to start with the goals, we want this lecture to serve as an adjunct to your individual programs, educational programming. We don't want this to take the place of what you're learning, but to supplement what you're learning. We wanna provide fellows with direct access to educational experiences with experienced AMSSM members and invited guest experts as we have tonight in a variety of formats. And this is going to be more of a classic didactic lecture. And we wanna make sure that we're assisting you in your preparation for your CAQ examination. So some basic ground rules. Uh, we'd like you to make sure that you've muted your, uh, your device. Uh, so there's no interruptions for Dr. Bales. Uh, we want you to submit your questions through the chat function and include your name and program if you wish, but you don't have to. And what I'll do is I'll be monitoring the chat function with Andy Meyer, who is our representative from AMSSM. And uh, uh, when the lecture has ended and we get to the Q&A component, we'll just take, take the, the uh, questions from the chat function and we'll go ahead and ask those questions of Dr. Bales on everybody's behalf. Um, and then after the program, uh, there'll be uh, an evaluation, which we'd like you to consider uh, completing for us so we can make sure that we're making uh, this program optimal for you in the future. And so please take a few minutes to fill out that, that survey for us. So uh, with the goals and the ground rules uh, completed there, what I'd like to do is, is introduce Dr. Bales, and it's an honor to introduce Julian Bales to, uh, to you all. He'll be presenting tonight's lecture on cervical injuries in athletes. Um, when it comes to sideline coverage, I find that the two situations which cause the most anxiety for the sports medicine physician are the collapsed athlete and the athlete with a possible cervical spine injury. So I'm really pleased that Dr. Bales has agreed to share his expertise with us tonight. He is the chairman of the Department of Neurosurgery at the North Shore University Health System and co-director of the North Shore Neurological Institute. Dr. Bales has interest and expertise in the diagnosis and surgical management of various neurological diseases. He is a recognized leader in the field of neurosurgery and the impact of brain injury on brain function. He's been involved in advancing the understanding of clinical evidence of chronic traumatic encephalopathy caused by multiple concussions and other forms of head injury. His laboratory research has focused upon uh, mechanisms and treatments of concussions. He is also a founding member and director of the Brain Injury Research Institute, which focuses on the study of traumatic brain injuries and their prevention. And for 22 years, he's been a sideline physician at either uh, the NFL and or NCAA levels. Since 1994, which is around the time I first crossed paths with Dr. Bales in Pittsburgh, he has been a neurological consultant for the NFL Players Association, which has supported research on the effect of head injuries on professional athletes. And he is the medical director of the Center for Study of Retired Athletes based at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. He's been an advisor to the NCAA and also the medical director for Pop Warner Football, which is the largest youth sports association in the United States. And he's the director of the NFLPA's Second Opinion Network. Dr. Bales has over 120 scientific publications concerning various aspects of neurological surgery, including four books and on uh, neurological sports medicine and performs editorial duties for a number of medical journals. And again, I, I crossed path with, paths with him many years ago and, and uh, he's a tremendous person, a tremendous surgeon, a tremendous clinician, and we're very fortunate to have him with us tonight. So. I'm going to uh, pass the, the uh, baton over to Dr. Bales, and I'm really excited to hear what he has to say today about cervical injuries in athletes. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Jim. Great to be here with you all this evening, and I'll try to share my, uh, my knowledge, and I also agree that, uh, you know, of all things that uh, we handle on the sidelines, that, uh, that, that this could be the most troublesome, because I don't I don't feel a whole lot of responsibility for cardiac arrest, although uh, we know it can occur. But, you know, the problem with a suspect or definite uh, cervical injury is that, you know, if you're an orthopedic surgeon or, or, or sports medicine or neurosurgeon, you're, you're, you're on the line there for 
the recognition and for and for proper management. And I always tell uh, people who are, are going to be sidelined positions at any level that you have to sort of fight against, uh, as I still do, the, the tendency to watch the play and to follow the excitement of the game. And, and, and really, you have to force yourself to kind of follow the ball, follow the action. And then particularly on, on high velocity plays like kickoffs and punts, be careful to watch for uh, those, those heavy collisions where bad things can happen and where most of the serious injuries occur. Uh, I'm in Chicago. We're based at Evanston, uh, Evanston, Illinois, uh, about 10 miles north of downtown Chicago. I'm part of the University of Chicago Pritzker School of Medicine. I'm at a, a system, 10 hospital system called North Shore University Health System, and I have no disclosures. So the, the history of cervical spine injury ha has, has really focused in sports on football for obvious reasons, because it was a uh, certainly a contact sport with high velocity impacts. And we learned a lot, particularly starting around the early 1960s. Richard Schneider was the chairman of neurosurgery at University of Michigan. And he had a lot of research, which led to our greater understanding of how injuries occur and the role that helmets may or may not play. Excuse me, so, Julian, I'm, I'm, not seeing your, I'm not seeing your screen right now. You're not? Okay. No. I'm sorry to interrupt you. All right, hang on. You see it now? Got it now, yep. Yeah. So you see uh, me okay? I see you fine. And then if you can just hit uh, the uh, slideshow and then- um, Is that good? That's perfect. There you go, now we're, now we're cooking. All right, great, sorry. Uh, so I, I think I was saying I have no disclosures. So the, the issue of, uh, of uh, head injury in athletes, particularly uh, contact or collision sports, really dates to beginning around the early 1960s with our understanding of how axial loads to the cervical spine occur, how helmets may or may not play a role in that, and really led to our beginning of our understanding and ultimately improvement. To understand and to, to be a part of uh, the diagnosis, of course, you have to review your, your cervical spine anatomy, spinal cord anatomy, and I like to think of it in uh, the, the uh, descending motor pathways and the ascending sensory pathways. And that helps you to understand why a syndrome like central cord syndrome, which is a vascular based injury to the center of the cord, how that affects the upper extremities predominantly or, or more than the lower extremities, how syndrome like burning hand syndrome uh, is a believed to be a variant of that. And, and then with spinal cord injury, of course, you, you can have the uh, full gamut of potential uh, spinal cord injury patterns, whether it's uh, anterior spinal cord syndrome, posterior spinal cord syndrome, and the others that I mentioned. So, I, th I think with that as a backdrop, it really helps you to, to, to understand and, and realize that in something about the size of your index finger, uh, there is more, more uh, important real estate than any other structure on the face of the earth. And, and teleologically, there's a lot of, a lot of old tracks that, that go from the brainstem down to the cervical cord. Um, uh, the, the tracks that make you jerk your neck if you have, hear a loud sound and uh, many of the things that are involved with decorticate and deep cerebral uh, abnormal posturing that we see with serious brain injury. And, and then, of course, then I don't forget the, the vascular part. Uh, in sports, or especially if you include recreational injuries, diving uh, has for many, many years, decades, been known to be the number one cause of cervical spine injury. And they are diving injuries are about the uh, uh, fourth leading cause of all sort of, of all uh, spinal cord injuries, and they're the number one cause of athletic or recreational injuries. And you know the mechanism. Sometimes, uh, as you get in practice and you're active in your community, uh, knowing there's a high recidivism rate 
of people forgetting about how these occur. You can, you can be an activist. It's fun. It's uh, important, and you have to remind people that uh, diving in shallow water is the number one cause. But there are other causes. Uh, young athletic males can. Uh, jump off a board uh, 20 feet and hit the upslope of a pool. Uh, we've seen cervical spine injuries from people jumping into a lake, uh, especially the first time of spring when a picnic table or some object was submerged and they didn't know it. So cervical spine injuries from diving are so poignant, uh, very preventable, and I urge you to be uh, uh, on the bandwagon of prevention uh, in, in your community. For sports injuries uh, to the cervical spine, football uh, has always been and continues to be number one. Uh, and as you know, uh, it's ordinarily tackling, sometimes blocking, uh, but a vertex impact with flexion are the most common causes. Uh, wrestling is also not unusual. Uh, dri driving the head of the opponent into the mat is the most uh, likely way that occurs. In ice hockey, it's pushing or skating someone into the boards. Gymnastics, of course, uh, from time to time has certainly had uh, cervical spine injuries. And uh, most of them, in my experience, have been falls uh, during a uh, dismount or, or uh, accidental falls uh, during an exercise. And here shows uh, uh, the classic mechanism of a uh, player being pushed from behind. And, uh, you know, if you ever, the next time you watch, particularly NHL game, if you notice that by the time they're pros, most of them have learned to put their hands out and break the, break the blow so the top of the head doesn't uh, first strike the, the boards or the glass. Uh, but this is the most common mechanism in hockey. Uh, years ago, we came uh, uh, up with this classification scheme uh, for the management of athletic injuries to the cervical spine. I'll take you through it. I think it has, for the most part, withstood the test of time. It is not a specific criteria that, that you have to know or would ever be on an exam, but to me, it's a way of thinking about it. And so uh, for type one, uh, that's where uh, there is a transient episode and if someone has a transient episode and they don't have anything which precludes either a neurological examination or more likely radiographic examination, if they don't have a structural contraindication, then often we let them return to play uh, if everything is clear. However, if they become a repeat offender, uh, often they do not. Now, of course, that's predicated upon how old they are and what their body habitus and size is, and especially how many they've had. A type two we turned were those that, that had a spinal cord injury, a neurological injury, and of course they never are allowed to return to play. And type three was those that had uh, some sort of radiographic abnormality, either a fracture, and if it's a, a stable fracture, you have to decide whether it's stable just uh, 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 under normal physiology or would it stand up to the stress of a contact or impact. Uh, if it's not, then they don't return. They should not return. And it's been uh, very, very unusual uh, uh, that anyone who had a fractured cervical spine and, and had to have fixation uh, would be allowed to return to play. Um, if uh, the fracture is unstable, of course, they're, they're fixated and that's it for their, their, their contact uh, career. They become golfers if they don't have a spinal cord injury. The final type of, of uh, classification of a type three in, in our way of thinking was another structural abnormality. So ligaments instability, canal stenosis, and cord contusion uh, are nearly do not return. So if, for instance, if you had seen a high school player who had a spinal cord contusion, uh, I would not recommend that player return to play. Uh, we probably wouldn't let an NFL player return to play. And if you think you want to, you better really uh, CYA 
in your in your notes and have a very good explanation if you're going to take that on to, to allow someone with this sort of radiographic uh, either uh, significant stenosis instability or core contusion return to play and on the right hand side is really other structural abnormalities and that's uh, bony osteophytes bony abnormalities or the most common would be a herniated disc so this way of thinking, either it's a transient injury only and they're not repeaters, they can usually return to play. Spinal cord injury, they can't return to play. And the third type, a radiographic injury. And I think you have to understand and catalog them in your mind, sort of uh, as we've done here. So to take you through there, this is a good example of, of um, uh, a cervical fracture dislocation. Uh, this patient ended up uh, having a spinal cord injury, needing a uh, fixation done, and uh, did not return. Here's another example of a burst fracture with neurological injury, did not return. And as you know, the issue is not just uh, the bony abnormalities, the impingement or the momentary uh, uh, impact to the cord and it's the primary injury and it's the secondary injury. And as you see here in this autopsy specimen, there's a, a large hemorrhagic component, but the secondary injury begins right after the primary impact and it proceeds inexorably and it has a resulting uh, spread of edema and eventually a uh, disruption of fiber transmission. And uh, uh, so far we don't have uh, a way to treat successfully complete neurological spinal cord injuries. Uh, another example, this was a quadriplegic injury with a, uh, a uh, sagittal fracture. Another example, this was a 1990s case, spinal cord injury in a, in a uh, college athlete resulting quadriplegia. Here's another example of a contusion, as you see here and here. And a better example in this player here of the contusion. So it shows up as high intensity in the spinal cord. And again, in every instance that I'm aware of, this is a career ending injury, radiographic injury, regardless if the player has, uh, has improved neurologically, you'd be hard set uh, to, to return this player to play that sport again, where this happened. And uh, most universities and probably most professional teams wouldn't allow it either. Uh, and then there's the concept, as I talked about, of, of instability. And a lot of times the instability is uh, not that severe and will heal with time. Um, occasionally they are fused, but until this is corrected or is noted to be stable on flexion extension films, uh, this is another example of that third category of radiographic abnormality, which uh, bears in decision making. Here's a herniated disc. You see this uh, player right here. I had a central herniated disc, the myelographic CT. Here's the die in the subarachnoid space. Here's the herniation. Now, these players often can return to play, but many times have to have the disc taken out and a fusion done or nearly anteriorly and have to sit out for nine to 12 months but it doesn't necessarily preclude the return to play. Uh, here's an example here, an MRI of uh, a disc fragment causing radiculopathy right here. And I got a call this week about a major uh, collegiate program where there was a cervical fracture, significant fracture uh, uh, just a few days ago. So it still occurs. And it occurs uh, certainly every year more often in high school, but it occurs at every level. Uh, and then, you know, for uh, a disc uh, procedure, one of the big questions is, do you do it anteriorly or posteriorly? If there's a soft disc posteriorly, you may, you may be able to sneak in there, lift that root and do a posterior approach and not disrupt things anteriorly and have to do an anterior fusion. So this gets into the, the idea and the concept of decision-making for fixing these problems and how that returns, how that uh, impacts return to play. 
And here you see uh, another autopsy picture showing this, this, in this case, herniation right here hitting the spinal cord. So transient spinal cord injuries are, 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 are spinal cord symptoms are a, a, a conundrum that uh, if you do sports medicine for any length of time, you will ex experience a patient, a player who has this or had had it. So these are, this is a study we've done previously. This is looking at 35 examples of spinal cord transient symptoms and Here's what they are. Uh, um, you know, when you're looking for, is it spinal cord involvement or not? You want bilaterality. And if you get lower extremities in addition to upper extremities, then that implicates the spinal cord and not the brachial plex or, or an isolated nerve root. So in football, most common, uh, quadriplegia, quadriparesis um, uh, is, uh, uh, was the largest number and the duration is anywhere from two or three minutes up to 24 to 36 hours. Uh, in addition to motor, you can have sensory symptoms. And we had one case in our series of 35 total who had a hemiparesis from a, a cord uh, injury. And the issue that we'll get into in a few minutes is, well, how do you, how do you manage these and particularly, do you let them return to play with any criteria? Um, transient injury usually is seen in football, hockey, soccer, and wrestling. So you need a high velocity impact or being driven into uh, the mat or the boards, as I mentioned. And uh, as I said, it can be minutes up to uh, well, 24, 48 hours. Uh, and there you see the symptoms. Uh, almost half have no radiographic abnormality. And cervical stenosis is seen uh, in, uh, in a little over half as well. So cervical stenosis is a very important concept. And, you know, depending on what textbook you read, some say if it's less than, if, you're, if your anterior posterior cal canal diameter is less than 14 or 13, then that's uh, uh, the criterion for cervical canal stenosis. Uh, certainly if you get under 10 or, or nine, and some people list eight is a, a sin qua non that you should never be allowed to play with that sort of degree of stenosis. Um, this is where you have to uh, have a good handle on what, what makes a diagnosis of stenosis and how does it correlate? Do they have other changes as well, such as herniated disc or inner changes, osteophytes? Uh, it may be a relative contraindication of play, uh, and certainly like everything in neurological sports medicine, it's an individualized return to participation. Um, what are the radiographic findings? Uh, does transient spinal cord injury really uh, preclude you to other injuries? Which injuries have a higher recurrence rate? Is there something which is treatable, herniated disc or osteophyte? And then how do you recommend they return to play? Uh, the incidence is believed to be 7.3 in every 10,000 football uh, participants. And the pain can be described as burning, numbness, paresthesias, as I mentioned, both arms, uh, uh, upper and lower extremities, all four extremities. Uh, and, and you really, you have to see them return to full function, normal neurological examination, with a pain-free range of motion. So what are the mechanisms? Uh, there have been uh, several, three uh, offered, uh, how, how someone can lose function uh, in their arms and legs and, and then that improved. Well, it's been said that it uh, can be neuropraxia, which is really a uh, peripheral nerve term that's been applied uh, through the years. I think first mentioned by Joe Torg uh, in Philadelphia years ago, uh, but it just means that the conduction is not there, uh, that it's a depolarization phenomenon, but there's no tearing, there's no hemorrhage, there's no edema, there's no structural uh, abnormality that we can visualize anyway on MRI or CT. 
Others have likened a transient spinal cord injury in your neck to a concussion. So it's a it's a blow. It's a again a depolarization from a from a mechanical force causing uh, the spinal cord not to work, but not be injured, sort of like we think for cerebral concussion. And then others have offered that it's a variant of central cord syndrome, which is a vascular injury, is the is the cord is perfused from the center outward, and it gives a variant of central cord syndrome. Um, a neurologist in the 1960s named, named Penning said that this was a pincer's effect. What he meant was that there can be cases of extreme high velocity impacts where the spinal cord is transiently impinged upon, but there's no demonstrable injury. There's no ligamentous injury, there's no bony injury or fracture, there's no hemorrhage, there's no disc herniation. So it's defined as the spinal cord being pinched by the, the uh, posterior inferior edge of the body and the subjacent uh, lamina, as you see in the red arrows there. So this is very uh, reminiscent of uh, Segura, which is spinal cord injury without radiographic abnormality that we typically see in pediatric injuries where uh, either the, the soft nature of their bones or, or the way they're able to absorb the blow of the injury, they, they don't break anything and they have a transient injury. So uh, you have to be aware that the transient injury occurs. It's not all that rare, uh, what the possible mechanisms are. And of course, uh, it plays in very heavily to return to play. There's another syndrome that's sort of related called spear tackler spine. And spear tackler spine has four characteristics. And that is they have a reversal of cervical lordosis, sort of as you see in this x-ray. They have evidence of previous minor healed vertebral body fractures. They have a relative cervical stenosis and they're a habitual user of fearing te techniques. So uh, through the years, uh, being on several committees at the NCA level and NFL, we've tried to eliminate head contact with the top or crown of the helmet. And we have in, in a big part. However, a spear tackler, someone who is still using that, that technique, hopefully a lot less than it used to be. So this is a famous case of a player called Chucky Mullins. It was a lot in the media about it uh, several years ago when this occurred, but you see his, his pre-morbid ex cervical x-ray here. You see, he's certainly lost his lordosis. He's kyphotic. He may have old uh, uh, healed uh, vertebral body injuries here. Um, and then uh, his final hit after suffering several uh, transient injuries uh, resulted in a fracture. And here he is at the moment of impact, uh, demonstrating uh, very uh, demonstrably the uh, the, the way not to tackle and that is making contact with the crown or top of the helmet. Um, so uh, if you see someone who has transient injuries, one of the things you have to be aware of is not only the, the presence of the phenomenon of spiritacular spine with relative stenosis, loss of lordosis, and uh, evidence of prior heel minor fractures. The fourth criterion is that they they are habitual user of, of, uh, of spear, spearing techniques or hitting with the top of their helmet. Hopefully this is uh, going to be a thing in the past, but it's always out there. And even players who aren't trying to do it, and sometimes, as you well know, still hit, hit and make initial contact with the top or crown of the helmet. So this is an important uh, uh, syndrome that's part of the concept of transient spinal cord injury. So stenosis, you see here, uh, this is a 12 millimeter canal. This was an NFL player who had um, a small canal, not, uh, not critically small, but by definition consistent with stenosis. He was 
an NFL player. And on his fourth episode, uh, he had prolonged quadriplegia. Uh, I hospitalized him. Uh, he was in the hospital two or three days. It finally started to, re to recover and resolve. And finally it did. Uh, by a week later, he denied it ever happened and couldn't remember that he was ever truly not able to move and wanted to continue to play. So if someone has repetitive transient spinal cord injury and they have a structural abnormality like this, uh, I thought his career should end based on the repetitive nature. I think another way to look at it, and, and I, I, I don't like to always look at it this way, but you'd really be criticized and maybe indefensible if you let someone have been paralyzed translating multiple times return to play and they had a, they had a, a, a final injury. Uh, here's just a plain x-ray showing uh, uh, what an x-ray looks like with stenosis. Uh, you look at the spinal laminar line here in the back of the body. Uh, this is so-called body canal ratio. The bigger than 0.8. Uh, some people call this the Torg ratio. Joe Torg popularized this in the 1970s and 80s, and it has uh, withstood the test of time. Uh, we uh, still enjoy using it because uh, so many of these players get x-rays. You can throw it up. You can easily see and calculate for yourself if, it, if the player has a Torg ratio less than 0.8. However, we don't we don't make uh, treatment decisions or return to play decisions based on this anymore. We use MRI and certainly MRI with dynamic measures. So here's again showing the flattened core that you get in stenosis and the inability uh, to withstand for, for some players, maybe many players, a high velocity impact. I published this a few years ago. This was a series of 10 athletes who had stenosis only and temporary paralysis. And this is, uh, this is uh, the breakdown. Majority were football, one was gymnastics, one was wrestling, you see the ages, and you see the symptoms are, are uh, for the most part motor in all extremities. There were two that were sensory. Uh, and and uh, we had certain criteria for returning them to play, uh, which I'll take you through. Um, the, the biggest thing in these players is if they have uh, a smooth congenital stenosis without a focal uh, impression, a focal disc herniation or large osteophyte, and they've only had uh, one or maybe two transient injuries and everything else is normal, they don't have a herniated disc, they don't have a big osteophyte, and they just, they have a relatively smooth, symmetrical uh, stenosis. Sometimes, uh, as you see here, I, I've allowed them to return to play. Um, interestingly, if you get repeated transient injuries, uh, if you get repeated episodes of spinal cord uh, symptoms, that doesn't preclude you to breaking your neck. So you don't get impingement, impingement, uh, transient symptoms, and then the next game you break your neck. Breaking your neck is a somewhat freakish, episodic, sporadic thing based on an axial impact that sometimes as you go back and study those films, you can't really see what was different about that impact than any other. And you probably know that and have thought about that and seen that before. However, if it's uh, repetitive, as I said, I think you ought to consider uh, with multiple episodes that they should continue to play. Uh, certainly, uh, if you are worried about a cervical injury, you have to think about other things as well. Uh, one is you see here in the MRI and you see the operative picture below, uh, subdural hematoma. Uh, now, typically, uh, a cranial problem will cause a hemi picture and not both extremities or all four extremities, but it's possible. So you have to think about a vascular injury, either to the vertebral artery or the carotid artery. You have to think about a, a brain injury itself, uh, subdural or epidural hematomas are most common in trauma. You gotta think about concussion. 
uh, brachial plexus injury, and you got to think about the inflammatory Parsonage Turner syndrome, which uh, ordinarily you don't see after trauma. I have seen it come to the office, and you know that's inflammation of the brachial plexus, and that should be in your differential to rule out. I mentioned burning hand syndrome, for it's described by Joe Maroon in JAMA in the around 1980. Uh, and that was believed to be a, a transient uh, minor version of central cord syndrome. And so they come literally because the fibers to the, those fiber tracks to the hands are in the central part of the cortical spinal and the, and the sensory pathways going up to the brain. They're in the central part where the blood supply is diminished uh, momentarily. And, and this syndrome also uh, resolves and sometimes is not necessarily with a single episode that precluding uh, return to play in my opinion. And of course, you see the vertebral and the, uh, and the carotid arteries there and, and the importance of taking them in the differential as you consider uh, the etiology. Uh, brachial plexus injury, stinger, stingers or burners, you know, are believed to be to the upper trunk of the brachial plexus. They're pretty common. There are three mechanisms by which they occur. One is shown here with a impact uh, to the uh, uh, to the to the player with his head to the contralateral side, ipsilateral shoulder, and um, that's believed to cause that stretch injury. As you know, the players come off the field um, uh, a lot of times with severe lancinating burning pain that's just severe. Uh, it can lead to uh, a pretty high recurrence rate uh, and uh, it can be career ending. And I've seen more than one NFL player just not be able to hit anymore because he had repeated land. It was like hitting your funny bone over and over again and getting that older nerve shock you get. So this, this sort of uh, stretch injury uh, is is one mechanism. The second mechanism is an axial load which hits the top of the head and impacts the nerve root in its foramen. So it's sort of a jackhammer effect from the top of the head. And the third mechanism is a direct blow to the supraclavicular fossa impacting the brachial plexus directly. This picture here shows the most common form. So what I do in these cases is I have the player come to the office, bring his helmet and his shoulder pads. Sometimes, especially in players with hypertrophic trapezii, uh, there's too much of a gap between the shoulder shoulder pad up here and, and the uh, chest. The trapezius is making the shoulder pad sit too high and there can be a pounding in the supraclavicular fossa. So you can look at shoulder pads. Most of the good ones have pockets that sometimes I will insert foam in to obliterate that dead space. Then you always wanna think of the helmet and shoulder pads coming together with a good solid uh, fit so that the forces are in sort of in your, in your mind being directed down through the torso and dissipating and not being directed to the Superclavicular fossa. Uh, a couple uh, players, uh, it's a couple cases here. This was a, a 23 year old Division I All American uh, wrestler. Uh, he had multiple episodes of right arm pain. Then he got new instead of left and bilateral arm pain. Uh, he, he had uh, findings on exam, decreased range of motion, positive frame and compression tests. He altered his techniques that didn't work. He had to have an uh, intercervical discectomy infusion. Here was his uh, large herniation, as you see here between C4 and 5. This was corrected. He was fused with an allograft and plate, and I returned them to play or nearly 9 to 12 months after surgery. Here was an axial view of that herniation right here hitting that nerve. Uh, another example, a Division I linebacker, he had a single episode of transient numbness in all limbs, normal neurological examination, pain-free, full range of motion, normal radiated rest, no fracture, no injury. He had a congenital uh, stenosis. This is about 
12 millimeters. But as you see, there's no focal fulcrum effect of an osteophyte or disc. And with a single episode and, and a normal exam, he was allowed to return to play and did not have a, a recurrence. So again, transient, uh, you have to have a good working knowledge of transient cervical spine, spinal cord injuries, but they don't go on to break their neck. Uh, finally, as you know, the, uh, the management of players on the field is important. Uh, I work with Northwestern University athletes and, it, and they're in games uh, here in the Big Ten. And of course, every season, even though we've done it for years, we will rehearse with all our trainers and uh, student trainers and EMS. And you have to have your, uh, your emergency action plan and you have to you have to rehearse equipment removal and transport uh, to get them to the ED and, and then begin your workup. Um, you know, for spinal cord injury, the athletic injury is really no different than any other uh, spinal cord injury that's ordinarily managed at a trauma center and by standard spinal cord injury treatment protocols. Uh, we do this sort of evaluation. We like to look at starting with plain films and then CT. We're looking for bony injury primarily or, or fracture dislocation or instability with flexion extension films. We always get MRI. We're looking for what I call a functional MRI, which is looking for the CSF space and making sure that that's preserved. It probably isn't really the case, but we think that that sort of is a cushion, but it, it shows you the sort of the relationship back to the vertebral body and, and to the spinal cord itself. So you want to look for that preservation of CSF signal. Um, and, and, and look, it, it, as I've tried to emphasize, a lot of these players can go back to play, but it's your obligation to rule out these uh, entities. Uh, and and uh, there's nothing more individualized in sports medicine than neurological injury. Everyone is different. You have to consider the age of the player, his expectations, his capabilities. Uh, is he getting paid for this now? Is this his livelihood? Is it the first time? What, what anatomical, structural abnormalities or predispositions does he have? Is he a spear tackler? Is he using good technique? Is his equipment properly fitting? So a lot more uh, than meets the eye in many cases, but uh, it's fun and it's uh, esoteric. So that makes it doubly interesting as you learn about it. So I'll, uh, I'll stop there. And I think we have enough time for a little Q&A, uh, Jim, if, if you want. Beautiful. Thanks, Julian. I really appreciate, again, your, your sharing your expertise with us. I, I always learn so much when I, when I listen to you and Thank you. I mean, I've been I've been on the sideline for 27 years now, and and um, boy, it's still the one thing that that really really gets me anxious. As I was saying at the beginning, and and um, you see that that hit that big hit, and and you're just get up, get up, get up, and you're you're hoping that you're going to see something, and then then you go out and you start uh, you know going through your your uh, your protocols, your ABCs, and trainers you know stabilizing the neck and. Um, yeah, it's just a very, very frightening situation. I, I had a couple of things. There are a couple of questions from the, from the group um, that I want to get to. And then I have, I have a bunch of questions for you uh, because again, I find that the longer I've been doing this, the more questions I develop. One of them was um, regarding, you know, you were talking about uh, diving and football, uh, you know, cheerleading has been, has become a much bigger um, year round sport, especially competitive cheer, where it has so much gymnastics involved and, and, and uh, lifts and throws and, and, and basket catches and things like that, even with, with young kids. Have you seen a big uptick in, in the uh, uh, cheerleading uh, injuries with regards to the cervical spine? Then also, if you could comment on uh, trampoline use for me, recreational trampoline use. Uh, well, um, uh, I, I haven't seen uh, cheerleading uptick, uh, but I, certainly it's out there. And I, it probably depends on your locale and, and what the resources there and what the what the schools are like and so forth. So I I haven't I haven't really researched that lately, but of course you always worry about the flyers and when you see them on TV or in person, you kind of hold your breath for the potential because it's basically a, a fall that they get. 
it is it is very uh, very common. Uh, I'm the medical director or the the head of the medical advisory committee for Pop Warner football. We're the oldest and largest youth football league in the country. We have over 4,000 games every weekend, uh, and I've done it for about 13 years. Uh, we also have there's Pop Warner cheerleading. So we're aware that we have not had any significant increase. That's at the youth level. Uh, but again, it's always out there and you have to be prepared. Now, um, the uh, you talked about the uh, fusion that you performed in the wrestler, the single level fusion. Uh, use that as one of your case studies. Um, you know, in, in most of, of the literature that I've read after single level fusion, as long as they're, again, everything's neurologically intact and, and no other uh, problems for that athlete return to play after single level fusion is, is generally acceptable. It, do you have a, a, a maximum number of levels that you will allow for return to play? Is it a single, is it a, you know, three level? Do you have anything on, on that? Yeah. In my experience, most, uh, most experts say single level only for return. Uh, you know, pr probably because the majority of these are younger and they haven't had the, the longevity to develop two level disease. I'm sure somebody has sent someone back at some point, but I have never seen or done uh, an athlete with a, more than one level cervical fusion go back to play. That's the answer I gave on my last CAQ, everybody, by the way, when that came must, up was single, single must level. Must be correct was, then. Was a max. I hope I, I'm counting on that now. Uh, so a question from, uh, from well, I, I won't read his name. I don't know if he wants me to read his name, but uh, for transient spinal cord injuries, you mentioned that spinal cord contusion may be a potential mechanism of injury. However, spinal cord contusion is one of those injuries which precludes the athlete from return to sport. Could you comment on the difference? Also, what is the time frame for you to consider transient? Well, you know, it's uh, there, there hasn't been a whole lot published. The publications say, as I as I showed in my slide, minutes to up to forty eight hours. Um, it goes much longer than that. I think a lot of neurologists and and neurological people would would say, well, maybe you you do have an injury, a, a more permanent injury or a longer lasting. Um, in terms of a contusion, you know, a contusion is like a uh, brain contusion since the spinal cord is an extension of the brain stem. And uh, that's a high intensity lesion on MRI. And ordinarily, uh, at least as far as I know, that has precluded a return to play um, because the spectrum from contusion to definitive spinal cord injury is, is probably there and unpredictable. And I always hate to think about things in medical legal terms, but you really have to in, in this area, you have to make every decision defensible. And I would advise uh, uh, young physicians or, or anyone to, uh, to, to collaborate with someone about that decision and, and get some consensus, uh, especially if you have a demonstrable documented uh, MRI injury to the nervous system. Now, I've had a, a number of cases through the years, thankfully not many, where uh, on a Monday, uh, an athlete will come in to see me, and uh, at the Friday night football game, they had a, a, a heavy hit, and they said that they lost feeling in both, uh, both arms and both legs. And, uh, you know, again, this is three days out. They're, they're potentially asymptomatic at this point, neurologically intact. Uh, I usually go ahead and work them up just as if I had, had been there when it happened. Is, what, what, what type of, of uh, approach do you use to those people who come in after the fact and everything, again, clinically at the time seems to be normal, but the history is such of, of a, a, a transient, it, and it's usually sensory. I, I don't have, I've never had anybody who had you know, motor paralysis that didn't get looked at on the sideline. But they come in with these sensory uh, symptoms uh, in, in all four extremities, uh, you know, again, after the fact. How, how do you approach those? Uh, they would get plane films. They would get flexion extension, lateral plane films, maybe a CT, and certainly an MRI. Good MRI, point. you're looking for, you know, particularly herniation and contusion. I'm feeling better all the time talking to you, Julian. I tell you, I got I to gotta say, 
you know, you brought up the torque ratio, the, the um, canal to body ratio. A lot of people kind of went, um, went, went, went kind of sour on that uh, for, for a while because they said, you know, the, the size of the vertebral body and these really large players will throw the ratio off and it'll bring that, uh, that number down. I never got rid of it in my own mind because I figured if, if it was 0.8 or higher, that was a really good sign that they probably didn't have stenosis. But like you said, stenosis, um, really to make the diagnosis on an x-ray, it's, it's not appropriate because you don't know the size of the, the spinal cord, even though the cord is a little bit more consistent in its size compared to the canals. Was that correct? Oh, uh, that, that's correct. And I, and I think I mentioned, you know, it's, it's fun if, because almost always you have plain films. It gives you a little idea ahead of time. And like you just said, it'd be very unlikely that someone had a torque ratio of 0.9 and they would have significant stenosis. So I think it's predictive, but it's not, wouldn't, it wouldn't withstand any medical legal uh, challenge. And you really want to see the, you want to see the nervous system. So you want to see the relationship of the cord and uh, disc herniation, things like that, contusion. Uh, but I do, I do think it's, it's uh, certainly very important historically and it is, it still does have some practical use. There's a question about uh, spine boarding and uh, you know, the two primary techniques are the log roll technique and then uh, the, the lift and slide where you, you lift the athlete up and then slide the board in usually from, from the feet. Do you have a preferred technique for spine boarding? Or again, is it based on the number of people you have present and, and uh, other things of that nature? I, you know, recently, recent years, we've used, used the lift and slide, uh, but certainly I think you have to be versed in both. And, and you could get in a situation, particularly in a high school game where maybe you wouldn't have, you know, eight people do the lifting and things like that. So I think you have, you ought to be versed in both, but principles are the same. And that is maintain axial traction and, and axial neutrality in position. Now the um, the pendulum has been has swung back and forth a couple of times with regards to uh, on the field removal of helmet versus just removal of face mask. If you remove the helmet, you need to remove the shoulder pads. Rob Blank at, at University of Pittsburgh way back in the day, he did a nice study with uh, the people at University of Pittsburgh looking at you know um, uh, the the uh, spinal cord extension or the uh, cervical extension if you leave the football shoulder pads on and and take the helmet off. And then the, the head uh, the occiput drops back to the board. Uh, do you have do you have a preference um, from your perspective at this point as as to whether or not we should be taking helmets and shoulder pads off or or trying to leave them on during the course of a, an on field uh, attendance to one of these injuries? Yeah, you you said it, uh, Jim. You know the, the thing is to maintain neutral position. I I sort of through the years have liked leave the helmet on, put the pads on both sides, tape them put a collar on and then transport that way and take the face mask off. If you have any concern about airway, of course, um, it's a bigger deal to start, uh, you know, taking, taking off uh, shoulder pads and cutting, cutting them and so forth, uh, which you wouldn't do on the field anyway. So I think you're going to package them on the field and you're going to get them ready to transport. And I, I prefer to remove the equipment in the ED uh, in most cases. I just find it so hard to maintain stability when you're trying to get those shoulder pads off. It's, there's, I, I keep thinking, how can we find, figure out a, maybe a, a, a shoulder pad mechanism where the shoulder pads can be in four pieces where we can unplug them and take them off more easily as opposed to trying to uh, cut them up the front and then still try to slide it over the head and all these other things. Yeah, the, the, the best thing probably is that rip cord, uh, you know, which allows you to, to buy valve at the shoulder pads like this. But I, I think, it, it, you know, unless there's an airway problem, I think that can be done better in a controlled setting and there's no urgency to do it as long as you maintain neutrality. So I, again, I apologize to everybody uh, as you indulge me in my questions here, along with the questions that have come through on the chat. Um, uh, I want, I, I want to make, make one mention, uh, you know, the Chucky Mullins, uh, case and the, the picture of him, uh, you know, spear tackling the, the Vanderbilt player. Um, if, if you actually look at the, the, there are some, um, copies of that instance where they have a wider shot of that, uh, same hit. And if you look at that hit, his left hand 
you know, when you go in to hit somebody and tackle somebody, your hands are open. And when you, if you look at that, the, the photographer caught it at the perfect moment of impact. His thumb is actually adducted uh, at the moment that the, the image was shot. And I, I, to me, that's telling me that the, the injury has already taken place um, because instead of the thumb being up in a tackling position, he had already lost the, the motor control of, of that portion of his hand. So for those of you who are interested historically and in looking back at those kinds of things, pull up that hit and take a look at that. And, and uh, you know, if you think I'm crazy, you can, you can email me and let me know. But uh, that was just something I wanted to comment on because I went to the SEC conference, uh, sports medicine conference shortly after that. And the entire conference basically was on cervical spine injury and catastrophic injuries. Yeah. Um, Good Julian, points. the last question I have for you is regarding stingers, because we see a lot of these and, you know, kids come off and they're shaking their arm and, you know, within a few minutes, uh, they're, they're, they're feeling fine and their cervical exam is normal and they have a normal neurologic exam and, and um, you know, we'll put kids back in the same game and, and if they have one, we'll let that go. If they start to have multiple, we start to work them up. Do you have a, do you have a point where you say, hey, look, you know what? enough's enough. You know, we, you've had so many, uh, yes, you've, you've had full neurologic recovery. Maybe the recovery is taking longer and longer each time. Is, is there, is there a certain number? It's like concussions for me, you know, we, to, to pick a number isn't really as fair as trying to see how the person's doing. But I, I was wondering if you had something uh, along that line with regards to recurrent stingers. Yeah, yeah you're, you're right. You know, you, we can't emphasize enough how problematic they are for many players. So it depends on your level of play. Are you making a living doing it? Uh, or are you in getting a college scholarship for playing? Uh, so a lot of factors. But if if they recur several times, and especially if it takes longer to recover, or they have residual numbness or pain, uh, then then I think they need a prolonged layoff, or or maybe even retirement. Or especially if they have a neurological deficit and weakness. You know, it's usually nerve root C5 and 6. So biceps would be very commonly involved or wrist extension. Uh, so so it just depends on how many and if they are not recovering and are they a skinny kid in high school, they probably should retire. Uh, if they're making their living doing it, you really have to get a treatment plan with uh, either, you know, steroids or anti-inflammatories. Uh, therapy, uh, neck conditioning, strengthening equipment, all of those things, but it can be career ending for sure. Julian, I really appreciate your time and, and uh, the effort you put into this for us. And, and again, sharing your expertise is, is really a, a, a great pleasure for us. And, and uh, I, I do want to put in a plug for uh, you guys getting to know your local uh, neurosurgeons um, uh, when you're taking care of athletes and doing sideline management, I have a very low threshold for uh, consultation and second opinion uh, when it comes to these kinds of things, um, simply because even though I may feel confident in what I'm telling the patients and what I'm seeing in the patients, um, the, I, I, do, I do like that, that backup. And, and I've never run into a situation where, where the neurosurgeon has called me and said, hey, why are you sending me this person? You know, they, they understand the, the, uh, the importance uh, from a long-term health perspective and, and our desire uh, to do no harm. And, and so uh, I, I implore all of you to, when you get to, to the place where you're going to practice, is that you get to, uh, to know your consultants and, and uh, make sure they understand what your training is and what you're trying to accomplish and the types of patients you see. Because uh, you see, you know, Dr. Bales is, is uh, um, taking consults from, from multiple levels of, of participation from all over the country. Um, because, because this is his area of expertise that, that uh, we just will never feel as comfortable with as he will. And, and so, again, I, I implore you to, to not take chances, uh, to, to be confident in what you know, but also be comfortable in, in asking for help when it comes to some of these difficult cases. So we're making the best, uh, best choices for our patients. And I'll, I'll get off my soapbox with that. But uh, again, Julian, really, we appreciate it. And, and thank you so much for your time. And, and uh, this will be uh, recorded and uh, we'll put it up on YouTube and we'll contact you with that link so you can use it for, for your purposes as well. Okay. Thanks. Great. Great being with everyone tonight. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Good night, everybody. We'll see you in Austin in a couple of weeks.